missionaries will introduce themselves and we look for all the missionaries that are here. You come and introduce yourselves. Father, we thank you for your goodness and kindness. I pray your name will be glorified and magnified. Thank you for a wonderful missions conference you've given us so far. I pray you'd help us to finish it off with a, a, a great blessings from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Kyle and Hannah Street are going to Peru. Very excited to have been able to be with you guys this week. And thank you so much for all that you've done, not just during the week of the conference, but uh, helping us get transitioned back from Peru to the States. Love you guys so much as a church. Thank you. Andrew Wilder, missionary to Bolivia, and uh, same as Kyle, just thank you all so much. I appreciate everything, the college and career uh, class for the basket, and all the goodies, that stuff was good, amen, so I enjoyed that, so thank you so much. Go ahead, man. All right. Uh, Aaron Vance, missionary to Columbia, I really appreciate all that you all have done this week. It's been just such an honor to be here, again, at Vision Baptist Church after uh, being gone in Columbia so long. Thank you guys for praying for us. Uh, we're so excited, and y'all come down and visit us sometime. We haven't had too many people from Vision down in Columbia, so doors are open. In Burkina Faso, there are checkpoints that lead to another country called Mali. And Mali is very much like Burkina. French is the official language. They use the same currency. In fact, Burkina Bays don't even need a visa to go to Mali. But Mali is very different in that Burkina, while it's only about 6% Muslim, Mali is over 90% Muslim. We need Burkina Bay pastors to go to Mali, but even more than that, we need American missionaries. We need people from this church to come and say, I want to help open the door to reach Mali with the gospel. Tim and Destiny Killing, missionaries to South Africa, and we just, we've had a great time here at the conference. I just want to say thank you for all the prayers and support that you gave us throughout the six months, and just continue to pray for us as we're on deputation. Nathaniel Moreno Francis, church planning missionaries of the country of China, and this week, uh, this conference was actually the very first official uh, meeting that we scheduled and had put on our calendar. Um, as soon as I got approved to the board and started making phone calls, I emailed Pastor Gardner and asked him if this could be our first official meeting. He said, sure, and we got it scheduled, but we very much appreciate everything y'all have done for us thus far, and would very much appreciate uh, your prayers, your continued prayers as we continue to work to get back to China. Thank you. Mike and Deanna Staley, missionaries to our U.S. military men and women overseas. And I just want to say uh, thank you for each and every one uh, for the great conference this week. It's been so refreshing. It's been so great to meet so many uh, people uh, throughout this week, uh, members of Vision Baptist Church, and we thank you for each and everything. Eric and Rebecca Elrod, missionaries of the country of India, and this is our last Sunday here at Vision, and uh, we're so thankful that we'll be leaving this Wednesday to head back to India, and we've uh, enjoyed our time with y'all over the past several months that we've been here, but we're looking forward to going home, and uh, ready to be in our house, ready to be back uh, in the ministry there, so be praying for us October the 7th. I uh, just mentioned just a, cu a couple days ago on Thursday night, uh, we'll be working a new church plant, and October 7th will be the, the launch date for that new church plant, so be praying Octo for October the 7th, and that we would see as we prepare the building and get everything ready to start this new church, uh, that many people would come to know Christ in that part of Delhi, and that we would see men trained and sent out across India to reach India with the gospel. Good morning, Ben and Caroline Thomas, headed to the country of Myanmar, and I just want to you know, thank you all. It's been a great conference. We haven't been in the conference, but we've been, <laughs> we've been enjoying the conference. It's been very good. I, I was talking to Caroline last night, and I said, uh, last night was one of my favorite times of the year at Vision, the international dinner. It's great, and I loved it, and it was even better this year, so holding out hope for next year. Uh, thank you all for praying for us, and continue praying for the country of Myanmar. Mark and Natasha Tolson to China, and uh, just thank you for your hospitality this week. It's been a great conference. On a Thursday, I was able to share with you about some persecution and stories of persecution and how God has been working in China. On Friday, we shared our video and showed you the story of what is happening in China. You're able to see that story that you are helping us write, and we're going to continue to write and to see God continue to do great things. And this, later this morning, I'm going to share about how God has changed people's lives, and we've seen people saved and kind of tell their stories and to just pray with us, and we're excited about uh, being here with you and uh, enjoying this time of worship. I'm sick for a country to which I Goodbyes will there 
there be spoken for time will not song. Uh, God, God really is good, isn't he? Um, well, while we were in South Africa, we had the opportunity of working in three churches, and the church that we worked in the most is Soweto Baptist Church, and we were able to start a soup kitchen while we were there in Soweto on Tuesday nights, and the, the first Tuesday night, there was a lady named Bonelwa who came to the soup kitchen. She was lost. She didn't know Christ. And she became a very faithful uh, person to church. She brought her kids. Um, and uh, the, the coolest thing 
that I saw while I was there, or the, the most amazing thing that I saw while I was there was there was another closer lady named Melissa, and um, she was talking to Bonelwa one Thursday um, night before service about salvation. And she was able to lead Bonelwa to Christ because she had heard about the gospel from missionaries going to South Africa and just to see the joy on her face that she could tell someone else about Christ and tell someone else her own people about Christ. It was just, it was a blessing to me to get to see Christ using not only missionaries in South Africa, but South Africans in South Africa to reach their own people. And that's, that's one thing, that's one reason why we want to go back. We want to be able to teach South Africans to reach their own people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for praying for us as we're on deputation. And thank you for praying for the country of South Africa. Amen, amen. When I was in Bolivia, I got to spend six months with Kevin. And Kevin's doing a great ministry and work down there. Uh, like, uh, he's got three churches planning and going. But well, one of the things I got to do is if you've ever been in Cochabamba, you get to see this big Jesus statue. And I got to go to this big Jesus statue that overlooks kind of the city there. And I got to go up there and just look up there and see just all the many houses and all the people and all those things. But it reminds me how it says over there in Acts uh, chapter 17 and verse 16, you know how Paul looks over and says his spirit was stirred inside of him. I felt the same way as the city was wholly given to idolatry. And if you know anything about um, Bolivia and, and pretty much in South America, it's just 77% uh, of, of the country of Bolivia is uh, Catholicism. And it's just so sad to see that uh, how uh, they, they know about Jesus. They have Jesus statue. They have uh, Mary. They have uh, churches. And they have all these things, but they're lacking something. And uh, that's uh, John uh, 14, 6. You know, the Bible says, You say to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. And that's what they're missing. They're missing the true way. They're missing uh, the way of Jesus Christ. And uh, that's what they need. And uh, I just remember uh, another little story of uh, I had the opportunity to help out with uh, Kevin and many different things. And, and we started a little English class uh, for the kids. I helped out with Beth one time. And uh, I was trying my best to teach English. I mean, I should, they should have been teaching me English because <laughs> I, speak, I speak terrible English. But I was trying my best to uh, uh, just teach them what I knew in English. And then I was pretty much, they were teaching me uh, Spanish. And so uh, we was going back and forth. And uh, there at, um, at, at English classes, our uh, family started coming, a little kid. And uh, we had a big service after we finished all the classes. And sure enough, uh, his, his parents came and uh, came to find out the pastor there in the third church plant, the assistant pastor, uh, led his father uh, to the Lord. And uh, it's just a great thing to see that, that just that little simple little English class has brought someone and I was able to see someone saved. And so that's just a blessing. So thank you all. Amen.
the Bible says in Psalm 74, Be mindful, or have respect unto the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. We've been ministering in South America and to Colombia since 2013, and um, we've seen some awesome stuff take place. Our first church was established and had tremendous growth. Uh, God has just done amazing stuff there, saving all sorts of people, and it's awesome to see people come from darkness to light. Amen? The second church was a lot different than our first. We, we actually, I'll tell you the little story about what happened there. We had a lady come to our first church, and she was getting very involved. And at the very beginning, and she said, um, listen, I'm the president or the, the community leader of a very um, different type of neighborhood in the north of our city. Uh, and there's a lot of kids in our neighborhood. Would you consider coming down to do a kid's Bible study on Saturdays? And our church had only been going for six weeks. Uh, but I said, well, I'll come down and we'll, we'll look at the possibilities. And we had some people there in the church. People were getting saved and, and starting to get discipled. And um, so we looked at it and I said, well, how many kids do you think would come? And so there was a park there and they said, well, probably about 50. I'm thinking, man, 50 kids, this is awesome. And so we organized it. We set out for the, the first weekend of September and several people from the church wanted to go down and help. And they were brand new believers themselves, but they could help organize things and color and sheets. And we're going to sing some songs. And I'll teach the kids. And uh, anyways, we had like 90 some kids show up. It was crazy. Um, next week we had over 100. And, and so this went on really for, for several weeks. And it was a great training tool for our, for our, our young Christians because they were getting very involved and uh, eventually I was preparing lessons and giving them to them. I'd teach every, every leader a lesson and they would take that lesson and then teach it to different groups of kids. And this went on for several years, about three years or so, almost three years, about two and a half years, I guess. And um, we noticed something that even though these kids are, are coming to know the Lord and it's great, their families are, are in horrible, horrible shape. And we would try to reach into the families, but we realized something that they needed a church there, not just a once a week kids Bible club. They needed a church. And so uh, last year, in March of last year, we were able to start our second work. And uh, the guy that's in charge of this work was actually a former gang member that got saved just, just recently, uh, several years ago. And God has just transformed his life. He comes from that same area um, of our city, and he grew up there. He grew up involved in all the things that most of those people are involved in. And it's awesome to see how God's taking a man who has changed to change the lives of others. And I'd ask that you pray for this pastor. His name is Diver, um, Diver Ortiz, and um, he's got a very interesting name. It's a very unique name. But God, God has just used him to, to change that um, that community really and we're coming alongside of them and helping them and we're seeing quite a few people come to the church uh, What you see here in the picture is is the, the the house that was converted into our little church building We cleared out the whole house. It's a very tiny place and uh, inside there's room for about um, 10 Americans or 45 Colombians <laughs> That's just the, And uh, we, we've fit 70 in there. I don't know how but um, and if you go back to that other picture, Adam, I appreciate it. Um, so in this little house, what we do is we, we come together and we meet, and um, they'll, we'll sing a couple songs, and they'll, they'll, they'll send the kids out, and we're right in front of a big park. And so in this park, um, they have all the kids, the kids' clubs, and the adults stay in the house and uh, have the preaching service. And it's, it's a tight fit even just for the adults. It's full. Every week it's very, very full. And the kids all have their, their groups outside. There's a bunch of them. I, I, we don't even know how many kids there are sometimes. There's at least 80 uh, sometimes. Sometimes they'll come and go because it's, it's an open place. In all the Sunday school classes, it's great to see that taking place. Uh, inside, there's, there's dozens of adults that are hearing this gospel message. And they've had religion for so long, but they didn't know Jesus. And it's awesome to see them. That's that light turns on. And families are really being restored um, all these kids, uh, just a, a little parenthesis, there's, a, there's this little girl named Alejandra. Alejandra um, looks a lot like my kids. It's very odd, and a lot of people say, is that your dad? Because she's, she's a blonde-headed kid, she's kind of lighter skinned than a lot of the other kids, but she's a little Colombian. That's, some of the Colombians are like that. And so anyways, um, Alejandra, as a seven-year-old kid, we meet her, and she was there the first week, and she's there now in the church. Um, we found out her story. See, her dad was, uh, was killed in the gang violence. Um, her mom was in jail at that time and, uh, for, for dealing drugs. And her mom was a, I mean, she's a nice lady, 
Um, <laughs> very well liked in that community. <laughs> Anyways, her mom was a much older lady too, and so Alejandra was her little baby, and, and she's kind of raising herself. It's a very sad situation. Eventually, her mom goes off to jail, and her grandparents are both are, are all passed away, and um, she had to go to some uncle's house, and there was just horrible, horrible things happening in that house. The the lady that was that I mentioned earlier, the president of the community, she she told us, hey really pray for this girl. I said, well, what, what can we do? So we, were, we, we found out that she was being abused in that house. There's three uncles living there, and she's still a little kid. And uh, we were just heartbroken about the situation. And uh, we, we talked to some, some different organizations that could maybe get her out of that, that situation. This is one of so many there in that community. A very cruel place, a habitation of cruelty. And um, anyways, we even looked into possibly adopting this little girl. Um, those doors closed. Uh, she had a lot of other family that said, you know, we, we want her. And so she was just going from house to house. And eventually her mom came out of jail, and she's back in the community, and she cleaned up her act a little bit. She's coming to our church. And um, it's awesome to see how this little girl, the seven-year-old girl that was coming to everything we are doing, nobody else in her family was, eventually several other family members have been able to connect with us the week before I left, just days before we left Columbia, I was down there and kind of saying our goodbyes to that church. And, and this, this young man approached me. There's two of them. And he's, he's about 28 years old, I think he told me. And he handed me a, a slip of paper and he said, are, are you a pastor? I said, I'm not the pastor of this church, but I'm, I'm a pastor, yes, of the church up the road. And, and I'm, I work here as well. And we teach the Bible. He said, well, I need to talk to you for a little bit. He said, look, I've gotten a bunch of these. And I should, probably should have got a bunch more. I'm tired of getting them. I looked at the paper, and it said his name there, and it said a citation for homicide. He said, I've gotten probably four or five of these things, and we always straighten it out, but I'm tired of living this life. He said, I'm really tired of living this life. And I see you guys every week here, throughout the week. I've seen you since you were in the park with the kids, and I see you now every week, right? next to the park in that house, and, and we listen sometimes, and I know what you've done with my sister, and how her life has completely changed, and how, it's just, how you just loved on her and, and cared for her. I said, well, who's your sister? He said, Alejandra. Now, he's, he could be her dad. <laughs> but um, he says, this little girl that's now 10 or 11 years old, he said, she has told us that we need to get saved. <laughs> we need to come to the church. And you know... You guys are good people. We're not good people. I said, well, hold on a little bit. There's no good people. You know, the Bible says that we've all messed up. He said, yeah, I know that. But, you know, you do good and we do bad. I said, well, listen, you know, the Bible says a lie is a sin just as much as homicide is a sin. And I may have never killed anybody, but I've certainly told a lot of doozies. <laughs> And I went through the Ten Commandments. I said, listen, it's not that you're a worse sinner than I am or I'm a worse sinner than you are or anybody's better than anybody else. We're all guilty, but that's the beauty of the gospel that it will save anybody. Amen. With tears rolling down his face, this young man said, I want that. I want that. And uh, it was an awesome thing. I was able to connect him with, with another one of our young preachers that was also a former gang member. And that lived the life that he's lived. He's spent some time doing all the stuff that he was doing. And I tell you what, God has changed lives. It's an awesome thing. The verse I read uh, is actually a reminder to God. It's a prayer to God. Have respect under the covenant for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. But it also ought to remind us as well that there's people that don't have the light that you and I have. Amen? And I'd ask that you pray for our ministry there. The house that you see in the background with the big mural there, it says Iglesia Bíblica Autista del Faro. Um, that house, well, I was just down there uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and this, the lady of the house um, said, hey, I need my house back next year, early next year. And uh, just so you guys know, I'm going to need the house back. You can maybe buy it, but uh, I just really need the house back. And it's a beautiful house. It's very tiny, but it's right in a park where tons of people are coming, and it's kind of in the safer area of that neighborhood. And I was just thinking, man, should we buy this house? It's kind of small. Um, I don't know. It would be kind of locked in here. And God opened up an amazing door because the same day, two or three houses down, you can show the next picture, 
the lady at this house, it was a store, one of the biggest stores in that community. And the whole first floor is cleared out, and the second floor is a bunch of bedrooms and bathrooms, and the third floor is another, uh, like a, an apartment, a mini apartment studio there, a studio apartment. And she said, listen, we've seen what, what you guys are doing. We want to give you guys this house for an extremely cheap price. We've fixed it up. It's extremely beautiful inside. The whole first floor is ready for a church. And we were thinking this would work good for a church. We have all the paperwork in order, and we'd love to sell this to you for $50,000, which there is an extremely cheap house. Even for the lower class community, that's a very, very good deal. And so we're praying that God would do a miracle. We are. And our church has already been saving as much as they can. But we're praying that between now and January, when we go back, we can raise that $50,000. And I believe that God is, is continuing to change lives there and putting a lighthouse in that community. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, we have money in our missions account. We've been giving our guys $5,000 as they do stuff. How many of y'all would be in favor of putting the first $5,000 on their 50? Amen. Okay, can we take care of that, Brother John? All right, now we'll sing a song. Amen. Stand with me again. Let's sing together. Francis, uh, Church Point and Missionaries of China. Of course, we're very glad to be here uh, this evening. And if you go ahead and put the picture up, um, this is a picture of a village Bible study. And while we were in China, one of the most incredible experiences that we got to enjoy was we spent a week in a village in China. We went with my Chinese teacher to visit his family and live with his family. But while we were there, I asked my Chinese teacher, and to the fullest extent of his knowledge and several other people's knowledge, we were the very first foreigners to ever visit this village in its 300 years year history. So several years before the Revolutionary War ever happened, there were Chinese farmers that were digging up ginger, ginger here in this village. But while we were there, during the middle of the week, it was, a, it was an evening, either it was Tuesday or Wednesday evening, we were there um, in his house and we were just and dinner was already over, and we were just um, enjoying some time together. My Chinese teacher got up and he said, hey, Nate, do you want to go to a Bible study? And I was like, a, 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 do you want to study here? Do you want to like meet together? He's like, no, my mom's going to go and study the Bible with some of these people. I was like, yes, I do want to do that very much. And so I went with him to go to this Bible study. We, um, there was a couple of street lights, but the roads were pretty much dark. We walked a couple of minutes and we went into this pretty small house. Most of the houses there aren't um, very small, but there are a few that are still made out of this uh, kind of mud and straw mixture and there's like a thatched house a roof and this was one of those houses we walked in and it was dark but we turned into this room that was right there um, and there was a couple of people that were already in there and it had the one light that was there and it was just two or three other people at first but several people began to pile in before too long and this isn't everybody in the picture but I'm pretty uh, I counted up afterwards and I think there was about uh, around 15 people that all met together in that room um, by the end of it but when they uh, got started we began 
they began to sing a song. And they asked my Chinese teacher, why isn't the foreigner singing? And he said, well, he doesn't know Chinese very well. And they said, well, maybe if we gave him a book, could he read it? My teacher was like, maybe he could. He's read a little bit before. And so they got out this old dusty hymnal they had, weren't using before, and they handed it to me, and they turned to the song they were, they were singing. And as, as I guess the Lord was blessing, this song just happened to be on the subject that one of our um, Chinese, uh, the, the Bible classes just happened to be on. It was Chuen Nung, the Ju Yesu. I don't know if that was right. Mark, you can grill me later. Um, <laughs> But uh, it was the almighty or omnipotent Lord Jesus, which is something we had just studied. So um, fortunately, yes, I could actually read most of it. And so we sang, we sang it one time, and we sang it a second time. And then the fourth or fifth time we sang that song, I figured maybe they're just singing it over and over again because I found the one song the foreigner actually could actually sing with them. But I really enjoyed being able to do that with them and to fellowship with them there. But so then, um, what I really wasn't expecting, um, my teacher explained to them that I was planning on going to China and teaching people the Bible. So they said, really? Well, would he be willing to teach us the Bible? And it's like, well, Nate, do you want to teach the Bible to him? He's like, yeah, absolutely. And so I figure I'll teach him for a couple of minutes, and then I'll tell him I'm done, and I'll let them do whatever they normally do. So I preached for 10 to 15 minutes, and then I was done, and there was this two or three minutes of very awkward silence where everyone was just sitting, they were watching and waiting, and nobody was talking. And I was like, what are we going to do? And my teacher asked them, and they said, like, well, they're not done yet. And I was like, well, what do they want to do? And they talked a little bit more. He said, they want you to keep on preaching. So this was the first time anybody asked me to keep on preaching and not stop. Um, so I got to preach for, uh, at least, I think, 30 more minutes. Um, they, he said that they usually ended uh, like another uh, 45 minutes later or so. So we got to do that. But I very much enjoyed that experience, but it wasn't something that I was really expecting, you know. Um, going there to, to communist China and to, and to atheist China, uh, we also got to visit several different homes. While we were there, uh, the majority of the homes that we visited had these different altars that were put up. They would, have, they would either have food set out or they would just have bowls and chopsticks, but it was offering uh, for their ancestors so they could have good luck and they could develop goodwill or good luck and good fortune with their ancestors. And so that was more of what we were expecting, but it was very incredible. It was a surreal experience to get to worship the God of all creation with a few Chinese believers in this village. And so that was an experience I, will, I don't think I'll ever forget. I very much enjoyed, but also was a little bit, a little bit um, uh, heartbreaking. Because they couldn't really go to church. I think they would visit the government church a few times, but we know the government church doesn't really teach the gospel. And so they would go there, and they knew that it really wasn't uh, presenting the gospel accurately, but it was really the only place that they could go. And they could meet together to study the Bible a little bit, but the lady on the far, the far right there, um, she is my Chinese teacher's mother, and she, is already, she was a Christian, already a believer, and she had a Bible. It looked like it was worn. It looked like she had used it over and over again, and my wife and I commented on that. But later, uh, my teacher um, told me that she actually couldn't read, that she had a Bible because she knew she needed it and because she knew she wanted to know Jesus, but she didn't go to school growing up, so she couldn't actually read it. So we're, um, we're thanking the Lord for blessing us with this opportunity and blessing us with the opportunity to go back to China to tell more people about Jesus. Of course, we're working in the city um, with Mark and Natasha there, but we're praying that the Lord would raise up um, Chinese pastors and Chinese preachers who could go out to these villages, go out to these small Bible studies to these people that want to know Jesus, but many of them don't really know the best way to get to know Him to go there and to help them grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but also to go out to reach more people who haven't even ever heard what Christ has done for them. And so we appreciate your prayers for that. Thank you. Amen. You know, last night Trent spoke about writing those checks, and he said that he never saw the correlation when he was young between that and people being reached around the world. I want to tell you a story that a pastor told me on deputation when I first started that I think may help connect these stories you're hearing to what you do for Christ right here. I met a pastor. It was our second Wednesday night meeting that we had. And on that second Wednesday night meeting that we had there, uh, he told us a story back in the night, late 1970s. This man and another man in the area, they worked a bus route. And they went down a dead-end dirt road. And on the right-hand side was a two-story white farmhouse. 
And they stopped by that two-story white farmhouse, and there was a little five-year-old girl named Danielle, and she was playing in the yard there. They stopped by and they asked her, said, well, do you go to church anywhere? And she said, no, we, we've never been to church before, but I, I'd love to go. And so they started picking this little girl up, and after a while, that little girl, she got saved. And after she got saved, she got consumed with one fact. She prayed every day the same prayer. God, save my mom and dad. After about 10 years, that mom and dad had two more kids. And the, uh, their youngest child was about two weeks old. And those two men who had picked that little girl up on that bus route, one of the wives got the idea that they would buy an outfit for that baby to wear to church. And they took it to that mom that Saturday and said, look, Will you do us a favor? We bought this outfit for your baby, and we want you to put it on the baby in one time tomorrow. Come to church with us. And if you don't like it, you never have to come back. So, but one time, will you just come and just check this out? Your daughter's been coming for 10 years. That mom said, well, if you love this enough to buy this for us, we'll come one time. So the next day, that mom, dad, those three kids, they went to church, and they got the kids their Sunday school class in the nursery, and the mom and dad, they sat in the back of the church, and the preacher got up, and he started preaching, and God started working on their heart. And at the invitation, that mom and dad walked forward, and they got saved. You say, well, what does that have anything to do with going from us to the mission field? Well, I'll tell you what it has to do with it. That two-week-old baby that that pastor told me about, that they put that outfit on, that was me. And you know what? All because of the service of those two faithful men and the prayers of my sister, I got to be raised in a Christian home. And at 15 years old, I got saved. And God called me to preach and allowed me to start a church and has used me. And now I get to go to the country of Turkey and to tell over 79 million people who are Muslims and who know nothing about Christ, about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And can I tell you something, friends? This church has an influence all across the world. And you need to realize that what you're doing is affecting people all around. And God is using you to see this world change with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Amen. Thank the Lord for that. Amen. And it has been great to be here this week. I thank the Lord for everything that's been done. And actually, uh, I hate to confess this, but this is my first uh, Sunday morning service ever at Vision Baptist Church. Uh, the last, we did come one other time. We were late. We dropped my son off at the airport when he went in the Air Force, and we came late to a service. But this is the only time I've ever been on a Sunday morning, and it has been great. Amen. We've enjoyed the missions conference and glad to be here. I'd just like a quick, uh, real quick, how many veterans do we have in the room this morning? How many veterans do we have? All right, several. Thank you each and every one of you for your service. I know we have a Marine, Navy. Uh, my wife and I are in the Air Force. And um, I always want to read one verse, Luke chapter 19, verse number 10. The Bible says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And uh, there's a lot of uh, exchange, joking that goes back and forth between our Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and uh, they joke about which one's the weakest, and usually there's not much argument about that, but, uh, and then, uh, and so they, they're always joking, and I remember one of the first churches we went to, there were several veterans there, there was a Navy guy there, a Marine guy, and they were looking at our display, and uh, the Navy guy looked at the Marine guy, and he said, uh, he said, I just want you to notice something. Marine, he said, I'm going to read it for you because I'm not sure if you'll be able to read it, but he said this, he says, uh, the Marines, it says, you are the Department of the United States Navy. He says, don't ever forget that. <laughs> and without missing a beat, that Marine said, yeah, the men's department, amen? <laughs> and so, but we know our Army, we have the Army Rangers, you have the Navy SEALs, you have the Marines. They don't need a special group because they're special in their own right. But you got the Air Force. And then the Air Force. <laughs> and we do have something. They're called PJs, pararescue jumpers. I first remember hearing about PJs when I was in basic training. I heard that they were come over the loudspeaker and said, hey, anybody that would like to go learn about the PJs, they're going to show a video. You can come and be there. And so me and another guy, 
We went into our drill sergeant. Now, this is very unusual because you don't go into your drill sergeant. It's not like, hey, Brother Gardner, i got a question for you. It's not like that. It's like you're trying to stay away from him. You don't want him to know your name, and so you never go in front of him. And so we said, hey, let's see if we can go to that movie. We'll get a little break. And so we walked in. We knocked on his door, and he said, come in, and we're standing at attention. And we said, sir... Uh, we would like to go to the PJ sh movie that they're showing about PJs. He's like, do you think you could be a PJ? I said, well, I didn't even really know what a PJ was, but I was like, I think so, sir. He said, well, let me ask you this, uh, son. Uh, he said, could you run five miles? I said, well, I don't know if I've ever run five miles, but I think I could do that. He said, well, could you run five miles with a 50-pound backpack on your back? I said, I don't know if I could do that. He said, well, let me ask you another question. He said, could you swim five miles? I said, I like to swim, but I don't know if I could swim five miles. He said, can you swim five miles with a 50-pound backpack on your back? I said, I don't think I can do that. He said, why don't you guys just go back and take care of your little uh, bed and get back in line and, and don't worry about the PJ thing. And I said, okay. So that was the end of it. And uh, then I was, in, I was in tech school. And one of the guys that was in our class, we only had four students in our tech school, and one of them was a former PJ. And he had hurt his shoulder, and so he could not continue on uh, being a pararescue jumper, so he had to uh, cross-train into something else. And I never really thought much more about it. And then our son desired to join the Air Force. And our son, uh, after he wanted to join the Army. We convinced him, you don't want to do that. You want to go into the Air Force. Uh, the food is much better. The air conditioning works, amen. And you don't have to sleep outside. And so he said, uh, well, I'll go in the Air Force, but I want to do something exciting. I don't want to sit behind a desk. And so he thought about being a PJ. So we went and watched uh, some guys as they tried to qualify to be PJs. You have to swim the length of the pool underwater uh, for uh, both uh, 50 meters underwater without breathing and all kinds of stuff. And, and then he decided he was going to go do something else. And so I didn't think much about it. And then when we were there as his basic training, I learned a little bit more about PJs. But then I began to read about what pararescue jumpers do. Uh, they, they jump out of planes, they free fall, they go to survival school. Uh, they really are the elite of the lead. And I don't say that uh, disrespectfully to others, but the attrition rate is 80 to 90 percent. Sometimes only one or two guys make it through a PJ class. They have to be EMTs, they have to be medics. Their whole purpose is to drop in behind enemy lines when an airplane goes down to rescue that pilot. They are that guy. They have to be able to, uh, uh, to mend the guy. They have to be able to give medical attention, and then they have to look for a way to get out. Uh, they are really special people. And as I began to read some books on PJs, I came across the pararescue creed. Here it is. It is my duty as a pararescue man to save life and to aid the injured. I will be prepared at all times to reform my, my assigned duties quickly and efficiently, placing these duties before personal desires and comforts. These things I do that others may live. I love that. These things I do that others may live. A pararescue man, he only saves a person's life so they can live another 50, 60 years. But a missionary gets to go to the mission field, and they get to preach Jesus Christ, and they get to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ, and they get to affect lives for eternity, amen? We've heard this week about lives in Burkina Faso, uh, Falso, right? Falso or whatever. Uh, just, just take the support, amen? Uh, just take the support. Uh, uh, Peru, China. Why do these missionaries do that? So that others may live. Amen. I'm going to give a faith promise offering today. My first at a Vision Baptist Church. But why am I doing that? So that others may live. Amen. The pararescue goal is that no airman, marine, soldier, or sailor would be left behind. That's our desire as we go to minister to our military men and women. We want, don't want anyone to be left behind. We want all to have the opportunity to hear about Jesus Christ and accept Him in their heart and in their lives. And so we ask you to pray for us. Uh, recently, a pararescue man 
uh, was uh, was uh, instrumental in the Thailand, the soccer team that was trapped in the in the cave. It was an Air Force pararescue man that was one of the leaders in rescuing that young man. Why did he do it? So that others may live. And so I cannot be a PJ, amen. But I can be an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And I can tell others about Him. As I was thinking about that verse, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. I'm glad that Jesus Christ was the all ultimate pararescue jumper. Amen? I'm glad He left heaven and came to this earth. And He died on a cross for our sins. He came to seek and to save. Sometimes we like to say, I found Jesus. But Jesus was never lost, amen? We were the ones that were lost. And He came looking for us. But let's think about that word lost for just a second. Lost. I mean, we lose our keys. I, I lose a contact sometimes. I wear contacts and sometimes I'll lose my contact when I'm taking it out. And you might think when you lose something, you just kind of like look for it real quick. But when you lose a contact, that's pretty serious stuff. I mean, because you can't see anything. And so I have been known to uh, get down on the bathroom floor. I'm not going to do it right now because this is a dignified church and everything. But <laughs> I, I'll get my flashlight. I'll get down on the floor to see where my contact is because I need that contact. They are expensive. You can't just replace them all the time. And so that's something that's lost. And that, that's about the only thing I've ever lost. But I thought about this, lost. And recently I read about the USS Indianapolis. The U.S. Indianapolis performed an important mission towards the end of World War II. A very important mission. And after that mission, they had orders to go to the Philippines. And they crossed the Philippine Sea. But as they were heading that way on July 30th, 1945, the U.S. Indianapolis was shot down, was brought down by a Japanese sub. The, the boat began to sink rapidly. The men began to jump overboard. And they were out there in the water and uh, there was an oil leak in the water and the, the men had oil all over their faces and they're out there in the water in the dark of the night. And they weren't out there just for a day, two days, three days. They were out there at sea four days before anybody even knew that they were out there. The Navy did not even know the ship had sunk. They didn't even know where the ship was supposed to be. But those men were out in the water. They, many of them were determined lost at sea. Finally, on the fourth day, a plane flew over and he seen the old big oil slick and he flew down to get closer and he said, man, there's men out there. Uh, there's people out there. And he began to count them. There was 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 people. It was an amazing thing. And he's like, man, we've got to get somebody to help these. We need to get a, a, some, a, a message to somebody to come and help them. And the plane flew over and there was another uh, uh, ship that was out there, the USS Cecil J. Doyle. And he told the, the airplane told the Doyle, he said, listen, you need to change your direction. We have men that are in the water. They need to be rescued. They need somebody to, uh, to get out there as quickly as they can. And so the commander of the Doyle, uh, Graham Clater, uh, he made a decision without any orders. He turned the ship around and they began to go where the men were. At 4.35, he got uh, orders from higher up saying, hey, you need to get to this area. At 6.30 at night, he adjusted his course to be where the men were, where they were floating. They were in a 30-mile radius. They were floating on rafts. They were holding on to their life vests, anything they could have. After four days, the men were dying of thirst. Could you imagine, they, say, they talk about it, can you imagine being so thirsty and have water all around you and cannot drink? They talked about how, how depraved the men were because some of them would start eating their buddy's arm and they would push their buddies off the raft uh, if they tried to get on and, and how the sharks were, would eat them when they, were, if they swam away. I mean, it was a terrible situation. They're out there fighting for their lives after four days. So the commander of the USS Doyle, at 6.30, he adjusted his course, and uh, about 11 o'clock, he was about an hour away from those men. And I loved what he did. He said, uh, the commander, Clater, uh, he gave the words, 
uh, that nobody on his ship had ever heard before. He told them, he said, turn on the searchlight and point it to the sky. And the men on his ship were like, sir, if a if, if sub sees us, he'll shoot us down. He'll destroy us. If there's the enemy out here, uh, we'll, be a li- we'll be a lighthouse for them to shoot it. We'll be a target. And he said, no, those men in the water, they need hope. And they need to see that light. And they need to see that we are coming for, to rescue them. Amen. The men on that, out there in the water, they seen that light. And it gave those men hope. And they said, hey, somebody's coming for us. Somebody's coming to rescue us. If we can only hang on for just a short more time, we'll be able to survive this. We'll be able to get out of this. I want to say to you this morning that Jesus Christ is the light that the world needs to see. My job is not to tell them about Mike Staley or his testimony. My job is to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. He is the light of the world. He is the light of the world. So Jesus said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Hey, our task is to deliver the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and stand with me again. We'll continue to sing together. Spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. What with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood, my life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. My Savior and my God, one with Himself I cannot die. My soul is purchased by His blood. My life is hid with Christ on high. With Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. You can have a seat. Thank you very much. God bless you so much. I'm excited about faith promise given. I always am. Years ago, I taught the Peruvians in Arequipa and Hunter. When I first arrived, the minimum wage was $25 a month. It slowly rose to, before I left, somewhere close to $100 a month. But I taught them to give their tithes and offers to support our church. And then I taught them to give to faith promises, an exciting thing because they gave this money. We kept the money just like we do here at the church, and then we supported our missionaries. We were having one of our missions conferences, and we had a guy named Ruben Efio come down to give his, uh, he was one of our missionaries. He was working two days north in the country of Peru, uh, two days by bus, and he, so he comes to the church, and uh, he's, I'm sitting up on the platform right over here, and he stands up and he says, 
well, I just wanted to ask you all to pray for us. He said, we, uh, we don't have a roof on the place we're meeting, and I'm asking God to provide us about $200 to get that roof. So I just stood up, walked over, said, move over. I said, we got $200. Y'all want to give it to him or not? And they voted to give him $200. And I went back and sat down, and he said, and we're also praying for a, fo a floor. <laughs> he said, it'd be $100. I walked over, I pushed him out of the way. He said, I said, he wants a floor. Y'all want to give him another $100? And then I sat back down, and he said, and we need electricity. And I walked over and I pushed it. We gave him like $500. And when I was, walked out last time, I said, do not mention another thing. <laughs> we are tapped out on you, buddy. But you just had the privilege. Come on, Aaron. You just had the privilege of giving towards a church, uh, a new church that they got going and they're a building. And you helped Aaron with $5,000. And I want to give him a chance to say thank you. Oh, seriously, though, so many lives are being changed. Um, you guys have supported us since the beginning, um, not just with financial gifts every month, but just praying for us, and some of my best friends are here at Vision. Um, but I, I sure appreciate that. It's, like Paul said, it's fruit that abounds, abounds to your account, and we'd love to have you guys come down and see it sometime. Thank you. We are blessed to have a church with 33 members that are missionaries. Their pictures hang on that wall back there. Over the next few weeks, it'll probably be 35 missionaries out of our church that, that's, all in, that's all in the works and all in the process. And I thank you for being a church that gives so much money and cares so much. Uh, Trent thought it'd be a good idea to show you right now. If you're a training center student and you're in the room, would you stand up? Do we have any training center students in the room? If you're already standing, lift your hand. We're training these guys, so they'll go too. Can I get an amen and a clap of hands for those people? I think you can have a seat. In other words, you are doing a massive work to try to get the gospel to the world, and I appreciate that. In just a few minutes, John will come and give our uh, offering devotional that he always does. He's going to talk to you briefly about faith promise. Here's my faith promise card. Betty and I have uh, decided what we want, feel like the Lord wants to give, what we can give. It's an amount of money that we are able to give. We don't pick up some fantastical number out of the sky. We think about what we have, what we're able to give, and we give. And, you know, there are people in this room that literally could give enormous amounts of money. You have that potential, and you can make a difference by doing it. I want to challenge you to be a giver. I want to challenge you to make a difference in getting the gospel around the world. And so if you, you know, I mean, honestly, uh, you know, uh, some of, you, some of you could give numbers that would just blow the other people's minds. I want to give a number that would blow other people's minds. I want to be giving heavily to gospel work around the world. And then after that, I'll be back up to tell you about this, but in just a few minutes, we're going to have a baptism. A young man in the church has gotten saved and is serving Jesus and will be baptized this morning. So this is an exciting missions conference close. So be praying about what God would have you to give. Get your card ready. And in just a minute, you'll put that in the offering plate. And by the end of the service, Lord willing, you will know uh, how much money we're going to be promising. Take your Bible, if you would, and turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I've really enjoyed the stories this week here and what God has been doing. And Paul's usually going to use a couple of stories here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 also to encourage giving. The first one is one you probably know very well about the Macedonian Christians who in their deep, spirit, in their deep poverty gave abundantly. And so he's going to use that story to encourage um, the Corinthians to give also according to their example. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7 through 9, the Bible says, Therefore, as you abound in so many things and everything in faith, utterance and knowledge and diligence and how much you love us as you abound in that, see that you abound also in this grace, this grace of giving as well. I speak not by commandment, he says in verse 8, this is not something that's, that's uh, uh, demanded of you. This is something that's completely voluntary. But he said the occasion of the forwardness of others, their giving, their sacrificial giving encourages me to talk to you about this, to prove the sincerity of your love, to give you a chance to put your love into action. And then verse 9, he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet he became poor. Yet for your sakes he became poor, that she through his poverty might be rich. And so he tells the church, as you abound in faith and all kinds of different things in the knowledge, he says abound in giving. Also abound means expand, go big, 
Do more than you've ever done. So story number one, he says, take the example of the Macedonians abound in this grace also. He said, this is voluntary. He said, take the example of the people who gave even in deep poverty. And also, if you say that you love God and you love others, here's your chance to put that into action, Paul says. But the quintessential example, the epitome of the best giver that ever was, of course, is Jesus, story number two. He made, he came from the riches of the glory of heaven to the poverty of humanity so that we could leave spiritual poverty and be saved and enjoy the riches of salvation. This is a transfer of the riches of grace, the grace of God to those in spiritual poverty, that they no longer must live trusting in a flip-flop over their head, or catfish, or their ancestors, or red ribbons on their hubcaps, or anything else that is not the Jesus of the Bible. But they can trust in Christ. And this story embodies to me what faith promise giving is all about, making sacrifices so that the world can hear the gospel. The flip-flop story just crushed me this week. I will tell you, I pretty much, this is my 35th year doing Faith Promise. I pretty well decided what I was going to do, and I changed it because they don't have to believe in a flip-flop over their head. They can believe in Jesus if they can hear about him. Our pastor's right. We've done a lot, but we can do a lot more. Let's pray. Father, we love you. What a great God you are. Help us, Lord, shine the light so that others can see the hope of the riches of Jesus Christ and the, the abolishment of spiritual poverty that Christ has wrought in salvation. We'll praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you excited about people getting uh saved and baptized here at vision baptist church amen and uh, so uh, Mariano's family actually came to our church for the folks that were going out knocking on doors. And he is ready to make a fresh faith. I'll say a couple more things to you. Get him out of the cold water in a second. Uh, Mariano, uh, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Yes. Okay. Uh, upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, did some of the Spanish church come in or not? Uh, okay, in the back is our Spanish pastor. Hold your hand up, Brother Jimmy. He's a Spanish pastor, and we are blessed that God is using him. And, of course, he has a wonderful wife named Joy. That's my daughter. And, uh, but anyway, thank you very much. Y'all are welcome to leave and go back. God is using him greatly, and I'm very proud of the work he is doing amongst them. Uh, our Spanish church, there they go. They're all leaving. So there's a, a good group, and they'll go across the hallway we thank the Lord for that. You know that nobody gets saved by being baptized. And you know that people get baptized as a testimony that Jesus has uh, saved them. And I want to challenge you now as you think about this faith promise that you would, if you didn't fill out a card or you might be going to fill out a card, uh, that you make a difference. You make a difference by helping. That's how we were able to give the money to all the money that we just gave to Aaron, the $5,000. We did that because you give uh, your money, and so just keep doing that. We're going to have a bunch of missionaries come your way now. I hope you'll enjoy this and listen up to them. Enjoy giving different names to people. They like to pick out random words and just give that as a name to their child. For example, a common name in Burkina Faso is Bienvenue, which means welcome. And the first experience I had with a man named Bienvenue, he was a plumber who came to our house. He came to the house and I said, hey, how are you? My name's Jason. What's your name? He says, Welcome. This is my house, but maybe you say welcome here in Burkina every time you show at someone's house. Oh, th thank you, thank you. Well, what's your name? Welcome. I know my French isn't very good, but he said, no, no, my name is welcome. I'm going to go, okay. Now I understand. Another name is Prosper, which means prosper. And Prosper, his parents gave him that name because their hope was that their son would prosper and become a great man. And when we arrived there in Zactula, we moved into a house, and Prosper was working there as the guard of the house. And Prosper had a little bit of a reputation in the neighborhood for being kind of a wild man. He, he enjoyed hanging out with his friends of the world, drinking and smoking, doing all those things. But we moved into the house. We started talking to Prosper. We began to invite Prosper to come to church. And finally, Prosper came to church. And I was excited. After a few times, he got saved. And I was like, man, this is great. The problem is, sometimes when your boss invites you to church, you kind of have to go or else you might lose your job. <laughs> so he made a profession of faith. And I was like, oh, this is great. Prosper's growing. But he actually told me a little bit later that he would sneak out doing church and start go out and smoke or go out and drink. And I was like, oh, man, that's a little discouraging. But after about a couple months after that, we were at youth camp. And what we actually what I started doing with Thrust Bear was every morning I'd go out there around 7 and we would read the Bible for 30 or 40 minutes and read it together. I told him it was a practice of my French, which was true in a way, but it was also a way to get him to study the Word and get him into the Word. So we almost every day for about two or three months we were reading the Bible together. We were there at youth camp and <coughs> we, we um. 
we were preaching and we said, gave an invitation. And Prosper raised his hand. He said, Pastor, I made profession, but I didn't really understand it. I didn't really know what was going on. But now I get it. And that day, Prosper accepted Christ. And man, I saw a change in his life. The next Saturday, he was out there at 9 o'clock with us on visitation. And I don't think he missed only a few Saturdays since then. He was faithful to church. He began to get involved in everything. We did discipleship. He was growing. He was my right-hand man. We were, he would help me with um, kids' club. He would do the translation because most of the kids would always translate to the tribal language. He started teaching the kids several times. If I wasn't able to be there, he would have the kids, re, um, the kids meeting, youth meeting. He was one of, our, uh, one of our, our, our youth. He even taught once for youth meeting. and It was exciting to see the work that God was doing in the life of Prosper. One day Prosper came to me. He said, Pastor, my heart hurts. I was like, like heartburn? He's like, no, it hurts for my mom. Because my mom doesn't know who Jesus is. And my family doesn't know who Jesus is. Will you go with me to my village and tell my village about Jesus? So we went out. We took the things we showed a film there about the life of Christ. We preached. And we saw several people in his village shaved. His mom, unfortunately, never did accept Christ. So pray for her. Pray for his other family. And Prosper's heart, his burden was to reach his family with the gospel. Prosper was always there helping me with the work at the church. One day, even the smallest things, one day we were putting out a church sign by the side of the road. And in Burkina, you have to understand, when you do a project, it usually involves about an hour of work and about three hours of running back and forth getting all the material you need because you never know exactly what you need when you start the project. So we go to the, 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 put the sign in, and there was a man there just on the other side of the little street where the, the, we were putting the sign in, a bicycle repair shop. So we went over and kind of asked his permission to put the sign there because you can go to the mayor's office and fill out 100 pieces of paper and wait three weeks for we get permission, or you can get permission of the people that live there and they don't care and no one else is going to care. So we went and asked him, can we put this sign? He's like, oh yeah, no problem. His name was Jacques. So we talked to Jacques, we gave him a track, told him a little bit about the church, and then we went over, started digging the hole, put the sign in, realized that the sign, was, the man who made the sign made the one leg too long, so we had to go get a saw to cut the sign off. So Prosper stayed there, I went off to go get the sign, and I came back, Prosper was over there talking to Jacques, and I was like, I got back, he came over. I said, what are you guys talking about? He's like, oh, I was just giving him the gospel. And I was just inviting him to church. So he put the sign in there. And a couple of weeks later, a woman and her teenage son named Sylvia show up to church. I said, hey, my name's Jason. What's your name? He's like, oh, um, I'm Jacques' wife. I'm like, Jacques, you're Jacques. He's like, oh, he, he works at that bicycle repair shop. I forgot who Jacques was. I'm like, who, who's Jacques? He's like, oh, he works at that bicycle repair shop by the road. And he told me about this new church that was in town. So I went to come and visit. So she came with her son, and that day that woman and her son accepted Jesus Christ. Amen. A week later, Jacques and his other teenage son came to church, and they accepted Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, Jacques, his wife, their three teenage sons, and their three younger children all come to church. And a couple months ago, their, young, their one son, Sylvain, he's 19 years old, he surrendered the preach at youth camp. Amen. Why? Because we're putting a sign in on the side of the road, and we gave him a track of prosperity, decided to go and give him a little bit of the gospel. An entire family was saved. An entire family has come to church. And one day there was going to be another preacher of the gospel in Burkina Faso because of that. It's incredible. It's incredible what one tiny act of obedience can do. Sometimes you think your ministry here in the church isn't that important. Sometimes you think the things you do aren't that important. But God can take the smallest act of obedience, like putting in a sign. And he can take that. And he can get fruit from it. And I was so proud of Prosper that day. I was so proud of Prosper every time we taught the youth, or every time we taught the kids, every time we taught the youth, I was so proud of him. You know, it'd be like, for you understand what it's like for a missionary, it'd be like I was the father of Justice Mize. Is the father of Justice Mize in here? Mr. Mize in here? You know, when Justice Mize preached in Nepal, there were a lot of people that were proud of him, but there was one man that was more proud of that boy than anyone else. <laughs> Maybe my son's Luke, and he's getting married in December. There's a lot of people proud of Luke, but there's one man, oh, he's really proud of Luke. Maybe my son's Andrew, and he grew up to be as good looking as I am. There's a lot of people proud of Andrew, but there's one man proud, as happy that Andrew's as handsome as I am. And that's Andrew Pearson back there. <laughs> and for a missionary, when we have young men that we train, and we have young men that we raise up, I mean, young men like Prosper, who doesn't even know what the Bible is, doesn't know the Old and New Testament, when he's out there preaching and teaching, it fills you with so much joy, it fills you with so much happiness, and you're so excited about the work that God is doing in their lives. I want you to get this. In order to change a country greatly for Christ, you have to love deeply. But if you love deeply, you will be hurt deeply also. And we were going on a trip to Bobo, and we were getting ready to leave here. He's like, I can't find my keys. 
I mean, when you have a year and a half year old, it's easy for your keys to end up in weird places like shoes, the toaster, who knows where else he puts them. So we had to go and I'm like, we'll find your keys later. Let's just go. I'm sure Levi just stick them somewhere weird. So we leave on the boat for a couple days. We were visiting, getting some stuff. I'm <clears throat> ready to, to, to come back or to get ready to move down there to Bobo. So we come back and things are a little weird at the house. Things have been rifled through a little bit. Things are kind of odd. So we looked and realized there was about $1,000 missing out of the house. And I was like, how did that happen? We realized that Prosper had gone a hold of our house keys. And when we were down there in Bobo, he came to our house and rifled through our things and took that money. Imagine that your child, your son, that you love with all your heart, that you raised up, that you helped medically, you helped him physically, you helped him in a lot of different ways. He does that to you. And we, come for, we talked to him, he confessed to it. We were looking at him and what do you say? What do you do? The truth is there's only one answer. And that is the grace of God. Amen. You realize that you are a sinner and you are absolutely nothing. But when you were a sinner, God looked at you with love. When you were nothing, when you were an enemy of God, when you were without strength, he looked at you with love and he saved you and he changed you. And you take that grace and you give it to others. Amen. You say, prosper, you're an idiot. Because he took like $1,000, went into the street and changed it for about $100. I say, prosper, you're an idiot. I love you. And you let the grace of God fill your heart Amen. and fill your life. A couple of days later, we sent Prospero out to the church and just started digging holes and to pay back that debt that he stole. You know, I don't know how Prospero's story is going to end. I don't know when we're here in the States if he's going to quit and leave. But I hope that one day you can come to Burkina Faso and you'll meet a man who's pastoring a church. Yeah. He'll say, my name is Pastor Prospero. And because of the grace of God, I'm here today. And that grace is the grace that makes a difference in China, in Peru, and in Burkina. Amen. It's not us. It's God. Amen. And I want to thank you as a church for loving missions, for loving Burkina Faso, for loving all these different countries, and allowing the grace of God to work through you to make a difference. Amen. It's because of you. It's because of your support, because of your prayers that lives are being changed. We want to thank you for making a difference in Burkina Faso. Amen. Amen. All right, seeing this baptism here, um, I got to baptize um, some young teenagers in our, in our youth group there in Peru. And um, kids actually a little older. There's, I baptized two young brother and his older sister. And the, um, the brother is actually a little older than Ian Bateman. So he's like, early, like 12, 13, early teenager age. But he's like, he's real small. Like people in Peru are not super duper tall. And he's so short, I'm not kidding, he's so short that he, can, he comes in one time to church, like, oh, it's, you know, put the kid in the nursery because he's so small. He's like, oh, I'm a teenager. Like, yeah, buddy, sure you are. Just going down to the nursery. I mean, for real. I could have baptized him. Boop, one little hand. Um, I want to tell you a couple of stories about some people there in Peru. If you guys can put the uh, first picture up. I think this is a picture you've seen um, already. Yeah, so this, I told you the story of this guy here on the right. Uh, Axel, this guy right here in the, in the yellow shirt and jeans with the jacket. His name is Rodrigo, and uh, we were doing an English class try to meet some people, you know, make some contacts to an English class. And we ran the English class adverts on Facebook through the, like, adolescents, the youth group page. I was in charge of that. And so he, he writes me, he says, hey, I see you have a youth meeting. This looks kind of cool. This looks interesting. And I said, yeah, we do. It's on Saturdays. We'd love to see. He says, oh, you guys teach English, too. I mean, great. This looks really awesome. I, I, I really want to be involved. And I said, okay, here's the deal. Saturday at 7 is when youth group starts. And in Peru, like, on time is, like, five, ten minutes late. So, I'm, you know, I'm expecting him halfway through the service. And I get there at, like, 6.30, and he's, he's, he shows up, like, five minutes later. He's like, hey, told you I'd be here. I'm here early. And I was, like, I look at a Bible college student. So I'm like, why can't you be like this guy? You know? And so um, I said, look, you ever been in church before? He's like, not really. No, didn't have a whole lot of contact with church. I said, yeah, I only listen for three things. If I'm going to be preaching that, I only listen for three things. You're a sinner. There's a punishment for your sin. And only Jesus can save you. He says, great, I'll listen for it. So he, he, he comes Saturday. He listens, I preach, he doesn't get saved that day. He comes back Tuesday for English class. He says, man, this is awesome. I want to be more involved with you guys. I want to, I want to help. I play guitar. Is there way I could play guitar, you know, in the, in the youth meeting stuff? And I said, look, we don't, you know, we don't just let anybody up and, and, and get on the stage. But we talked, you know, the, the leaders there, we said, look, here's the deal. You got you to comply with a few things. And one of those things is you have to meet with me every hour, or every hour, once a, once a week for an hour to, to study the Bible. He says, no problem, I can do that. And so the very first time we get together, he's like, he literally tells me, he goes, I don't know anything about the Bible. I don't know anything about God. Will you please teach me? I said, that, man, perfect. Open door. 
And like I told you guys, Colossians chapter 4, Paul's praying for open doors. I mean, the more I pray for open doors to share the gospel, I just happen to find all these open doors to share the gospel. It's incredible. Amen. And so, you know, uh, first we guys said, look, let's just start real basic. I went through the Romans road. The Bible says all sin comes short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, none at one. And it was like, it blew his mind because he'd never heard anything like this before. He's like, so I'm going to die and go to hell, but I don't have to because Jesus died for me and I can for free not go to hell. I was like, yeah, I missed the long and the short of it. Basically, he says, I just blew his mind. Couldn't, like, he was just circuits overloaded. So the next week we get together, we go to Ephesians chapter 2, and I said, look, man, you're dead in your sin. And unless, you know, the only way you can have life is through Jesus Christ. And unless you place your faith in Christ, you're not getting saved. And he's like, I... I know I could kind of see that like the, the gears were turning, the, the light was kind of coming on. He says, but I got a problem. He says, I want to be, I want to be a millionaire. And uh, I said, look, money's fine. Money's great. Money's wonderful. I know several people that God has prospered them. But let's look at what 1 Timothy 6 says, that if you go looking for money and you love money, you are going to find yourself in a whole bunch of problems. And I could tell that he was like, he's like, I got these doubts, but I see what you're saying is true and the Holy Spirit's working, but I'm just, I'm kind of... Kind of between two, you know? And so the next week I, I was, uh, I had to travel, so I couldn't get together. But that fourth week we get together, I mean, now I knew. Because I, I, I know he's unsaved. I know he loves money. So I said, let's go to the Gospel of Luke. Luke 16, we go to where the, uh, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And says, what's, what's, so we go through the story. I said, what do we learn here? He says, well, you know, money's not all that important, but what's really important is family. I said, hold it, dude, you missed it. Family's not important in this story. In fact, family's like the opposite of important because the rich man says, hey, send Lazarus back. So that my family doesn't come here. So I don't want, where I am is so terrible that I don't want to be with my family. And like, that, was the, like, that was the moment. And something I remember learning here when I was studying at the Our Generation Training Center, actually a class that Mark Tolson taught. Um, he said, whenever I lead somebody to the Lord, he says, I don't, I don't say pray this prayer. Because I don't, I, and there's nothing wrong with that. He says, but I just think that salvation is like a you have to make that decision. I'm not going to make that decision for you type deal. And so I've, I've always done that, especially in a country where you can, you know, sneeze and make somebody pray a prayer. And so... He never gave me a chance. Like, I was like, no, I'm like, I'll pray, and then you pray. But he's just like, so this is true. He's like, yes. He's like, I need to be saved. I said, yes. I was getting ready to say, look, if you want to get saved, I can pray, and then you can pray and you know, receive Christ. And he just started praying. He's like, God, I need to talk to you. Uh, I'm not saved. I know you've got a plan for my life, and I know you don't want me to go to hell. And he got saved, and it was so exciting. I mean, he, he came, and he, he never knew church. He'd never been in church. And, and, and so he began to study the Bible and, and, and you know, do discipleship and follow up and all that stuff. And, we're, 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 we're together, and he's asking me a question. I said, that's a great question. I forgot what he asked, but I said, that's a great question. Go to, I, I don't remember the book, but I think, we'll say, go, go to Romans. And he's like, he starts in Genesis. He's like, well, it's not this one. It's not, he just didn't know. I mean, I had to literally, you know, the big, the big numbers, those are, those are chapters. And each book of the Bible is made up of chapters. And those little numbers, those are verses. Each, each chapter has several verses in it. And, and what Jason said is so true. I mean, just seeing somebody grow in their faith and knowing that I had the privilege to teach this kid what, what, what is a Bible chapter, what is a Bible verse, how, it's just so exciting. It's so exciting. And, and, and honestly, his story, it came from this, me praying and saying, God, help me to see some people saved. God, help me share the, share the gospel with unbelievers. Can you guys go to the next picture, please? Um, this right here, this picture. So the guy in the front, this is Javier. He's co-pastor of the church. I tell him he's, you know, he's so short, he has to jump to get in his own selfies. I mean, so that's, yeah. But behind him, um, he really is. He's like this tall. Uh, you probably couldn't see him behind this pulpit. But um, this girl right here, this is Angela and her younger sister, Jessalyn. They came to English class. They came as a result of English class. And we invited them to, you know, the, the, we did English class. And like from the get, I was like, look, we're here. We're a church. We need to come to church. Here's a flyer. Come to our church. Like, we're not holding any secrets. We're here to tell you about Jesus. And also, if you could speak English, that'd be pretty bueno, too. You know? And so, uh, First week I invited her, you know, or we invited her, she didn't come. Second week didn't come. Third week didn't come. I think the fourth week we invited her, she shows up to youth meeting. It was the first time she'd been to like any kind of church service at our church. And so I was preaching, and I always, always, always give an invitation for salvation when I preach. And so I preach, and I gave an invitation. I said, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, and you want to know Jesus, I mean, her hand went up. And so Sylvia, who's, a, who's another lady in the church, her and Hannah, they took her out. And they witnessed to her, and the first time she came to church, her and her sister got saved. And it was so exciting. It was like, so with one guy, it was like I had to go and witness to him multiple times, multiple times, multiple times. But apparently God was already working in her heart, and God was already, because she's like, I, whatever, whatever Jesus offers, I need it. And she got sent. So, man, her family, they don't miss. I mean, every Sunday, they are there. I mean, it, it's just so exciting to see that God has, has saved them and changed them and worked on their lives. And can you go to the last picture, please? And so this right here, this picture that you're about to see, Obviously, I mean, you pretty much all know who I am. Um, this is me. This is Justin. He's a Bible college student there in Omega. This is Javier. I told you he was short. And this is Matias. And so one day, we were, I was kind of trying to figure out where am I going to start a church. This is before I knew I was going to take another church. So we're, let's just drive around the city and figure out where we're going to find a church. And, and I took Matias with me because he, um, 
his mom came to me. She's like, hey, you know, my son is going through a lot of really bad problems. It's the, Matthias is going through a lot of problems right now. Is there any way that you think you can maybe, you know, disciple him? And, and the first time we got together to discipleship, I was like, hey, you know, good to know you. Because he's my Sunday school class. And I was teaching him. And do you have any questions? No. Uh, nothing going on in your life? No. Any prayer requests? No. You just want to go ahead and get a lesson? Yeah. It was real quiet, real shy. But as time went on, it was like, I mean, he just, he just, he'd just be coming into my house, ask for questions about the Bible for like three, four hours at a time. It was incredible to see how he changed some way. Look, this kid, I'm, I'm really trying to push him to go to, to you know, to commit to the ministry, and I think, I think that's the direction what God has for him. And so we just drive him around the city and show him what the need of the city is. And so this is like the southeast-ish corner of the city. And right behind us, you can't see it. And so I actually, I actually texted him. I said, hey, I'm in a missions conference. I've got 20 minutes to tell some stories from Peru. What should I tell? I don't think he's going to tell some funny stories. And like, he's just like real serious. He's like, you need to tell him about the time you took me to a cemetery. And there's like 20,000 tombstones. And everybody there died and went to hell because they need to know the world needs the gospel. I'm like, dude, chill. you're like 14, man. Chill. Like, what? And so literally right behind us, so this is us looking over the city. That's a fifth maybe of the city. That's like one, two districts. And, that's, that's a, and it's just all... You can't even see the whole city from there. And so we're praying over the city, and, and behind us, he's right, there's this humongous cemetery. It's like 20, 25,000 tombstones, and some of those people died without hearing the gospel. I bet, you know, 99% of them, or died without knowing Christ. I, I, I would bet the great majority. And so please pray for him. It's actually kind of a weird story. He, like, our last week there, he comes up. He's like, well, I'm leaving. I was like, what? Where are you going? He's like, I just found out I'm moving to Canada tomorrow. I was like, for like, Canada, Canada? Like, for real? He's like, yeah, uh, my parents just told me that, you know, I'm moving to Canada to go for a soccer tryout. And so we're, we're still in contact. We're still writing. He's found the church. Just please pray for him. He is, he is, uh, he is abroad. He misses Peru. I understand. But please pray for him. I really, he's 14 years old. I really do think God has a, a, a future in the ministry for him. Um, so please pray for him. I'll tell you a few other not-so-intense stories about, you know, 20,000 tombstones that are kind of funny. Um, so in uh, northern Peru, they eat a lot of rice. Um, and you know the deal, if you are a missionary, what, whatever, Andrew Wilder said, whatever they put on your plate, don't ask questions, you just eat it, okay? If it's moving, eat it, whatever, if it's looking back at you, close your eyes and just eat it. So we go up to Northern Peru, it's me, David, Sean, and Joaquin, another Bible college student. Northern Peru, they eat tons of rice, like ungodly amounts of rice. Like, they just take their shovel, like, here's your rice, and then they, you know, put your, put your dinner on top of it. And so like, and Adikipa is a, is an early morning city. Like, I can't tell you how many times the little, little, little watchman in our neighborhood has, like, knocked on my door at 6 a.m. on a Saturday. Like, hey, you just don't forget trash comes today. And I'm like, you ever knock on my door again at 6 in the morning, you will, you, you're, you're dead. So, you know, next Saturday, hey, trash still do. And so, but northern Peru or in Chiclayo is kind of the opposite. It's like kind of sleep in a little, but you, you do stuff later. And so just, just think, you know, I'm used to, like, getting up early where it's not humid. Now I'm on the coast where it's super humid. And so, hey, we're going to have dinner at 7. And then you're going to have church at 8, and then you're going to eat at 9 again, and then you're going to go play soccer. And then we'll probably hang out and have a snack afterwards. I'm like, I'm in bed at like 1030. What are you doing? <laughs> and every time we eat, I, I'm not exaggerating, they give you at least a pound and a half of rice, and you've got to eat it all because you can't not eat it. I mean, it's just offensive. Or like, I'm in somebody's house. I'm like, i got the most delicious rice I've ever eaten, and it is good rice, but it's like, I'm crying rice. <laughs> and so uh, Joaquin is, I mean, Joaquin's a big dude, and so David's like, hey, you eat everything they put. And he's like, <laughs> he's crazy. Like, but David, you didn't eat your rice. He says, well, I have to preach. I can't preach in a full stomach. You know how it is. So, but do, do please pray for the ministry in Peru. Um, God's using David there at Omega. Um, hopefully God will be using us there very shortly in the future. And I really do believe our best days are ahead of us. Not that we haven't had some incredible days in the past, because we have had some legendary days in the past in the history of our ministry, as I think we all know. But I really do believe God is interested in working in the future. Amen. And I really do believe our best days are ahead. So please, please, please keep praying for us there in the ministry in Peru. Amen. Go ahead and stand with me one last time. We'll sing together.
given counsel to the Lord. Who can question any of His words? Who can teach the one who knows all things? Who can fathom all His wondrous deeds? Behold. All right, open up your Bibles to Numbers chapter 16, Numbers chapter 16, and uh, I love that song. We sing that song in China, and uh, it makes me think about our church in China and uh, a room full of Chinese people singing the same song and worshiping the same God, and it is an exciting thing. And uh, this morning, I just want to uh, use this passage of Scripture to try to illustrate uh, a truth that many of us know. And so kind of using an Old Testament story to illustrate a New Testament truth, and I want to show uh, how that kind of has played out in China a little bit. When we were traveling on deputation, we were telling stories from vision of how God worked here and how people were saved here and, and, the, and the different work that God did in your lives. And uh, we were telling churches that as we were traveling. And now that we've been in China and been serving in China, we're coming back and now we get to tell the stories of how God's been working in China. And it's an exciting thing to be part of God's work. It's an exciting thing to see God change people's lives. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to give you their names, and I'm going to tell you their stories. But before I do that here in just a minute, I want you to see this truth here in Numbers chapter 16. In verse 45 it says, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. And so Moses and Aaron, they're there in the congregation. They had sinned against God. They, they decided they were going to follow Korah and they were going to go do things that God did not command them to do, that they were going to do their own thing and that they were going to rebel against God and complain against God. And because he had sinned against, they have sinned against him, all of a sudden God's wrath is going to come down upon them. And Moses and Aaron knows it's coming. And they fall down upon their face because they know the wrath of God is coming. The first thing they do is they're going to fall down and they're going to say, we have, we have to come before God. Maybe God will have mercy. Maybe God will have grace upon them. And as soon as they do that, look in verse 46, and it says, And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer and put fire therein, 
and from, from off the altar and put on incense and go quickly into the congregation and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord and the plague is begun. So because of God's wrath coming down upon them for their sins, all of a sudden there was a plague that was going to come through the congregation. And if you can imagine this, as I try to visualize this in my head, the congregation is there and the people are out there and they're spread out. And all of a sudden the wrath of God is coming and the plague is coming through just to sweep through. And as the plague comes through, what is happening? Look at verse 47. And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living. And the plague was stayed. And so the plague was going through and people were dying. People were dying. And they said, there's something we have to do to make the plague stop. We, have, we don't want the whole congregation to die. And then Moses looks at Aaron and he says, look, you have to run and you have to get this censer. He says, look, this is an urgent task that we have to do. This isn't just something that you can just go and just, just idly by doing. He says, no, he says, go. He says, go quickly into the congregation. He says, they need an atonement. And as you look at the people around the world, as you, as you hear the stories from around the world, understand that those people need the exact same thing. The plague of sin is going through country by country and it is taking lives. And unless somebody runs into the mist and holds forth the gospel and lets them know that the atonement has been made, they're going to die without Christ. And they're going to be eternally separated from Him. No more hope. The hope for these people was that Aaron would run into the mist and that he would hold forth this censer and the plague would be stayed right there. For us, the atonement, it's already done. Jesus has done everything that needs to be done. He has died on the cross and he rose again from the dead. And look, we can be justified by putting our faith in him. Everything is done. There's only one step left, and that is to declare the revelation of Jesus to them. And to declare it to them, we know the Bible tells us in the New Testament that there has to be a preacher, there has to be somebody sent. Somebody has to go forth, and somebody has to open up their mouths, and they have to tell them the gospel. When they hear the gospel, they can believe. And when they believe, all of a sudden, the plague is stayed right there in their lives. The man that is leading our church, his name is Charles. And Charles, he grew up out in the village. And when he grew up out in the village, he said, you know, one day, he said, we didn't go to church. We didn't do anything. There was no church out there. He says, but one day, he says, I remember very, very clearly. He says, we were down playing in a creek. And he said, a missionary came by. And he said, that's the first time I ever heard of Jesus. And he says, I don't know where he came from. I don't know where he went. But a missionary came through our little village. And he said, he started telling us about Jesus. He said, the first time I ever heard his name. And he, he was a kid. And he said, that missionary led my mom to Christ. Amen. And you understand that the, the, the plague, it, it doesn't have favorites. It's, it's going for everyone. And the plague is just sweeping through. And as it's going through, it's taking lives. And all of a sudden, in this little village, people are dying because of their sins. People are dying because they don't know Christ. And they're going to go to eternal hell. And all of a sudden, somebody came in and they held forth that censer. And they said, Jesus, Jesus saves. He says, if you believe in him, you can have eternal life. And his mom trusted Christ. And his mom eventually found a church somewhere and started taking the church and started studying the Bible with him so that he also could hear the gospel. When we moved to Dalian, Dalian's a small city of about 6 million people. And we get there, we don't know a lot of people. And we had been there, we had been working there for a couple years at this point. And we go to an English corner, and I'm there at the English corner, and I'm getting ready to leave. We've just been talking for about two hours with people, and uh, I, I, I turn around, and I walk down, and all of a sudden this guy comes up, and uh, he's wearing, a, I think, a cross necklace. And uh, I just said, hi, my name's Mark. And he said, he said hi, my name's Ryan. And, uh, and, he, and he says, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a pastor. I said, what about you? And he says, he says really, you're a pastor? I said, yeah. And he goes, well, I want to be a Christian. And I said, Wonderful. <laughs> I mean, 
when does that ever happen? I mean, you're just walking and you're just like, I'm a pastor. He says, I want, I want to be a Christian. And I said, great. And I said, when do you got time to study the Bible? And he says, well, you can come to my dorm next week. And so we signed, we went to his dorm and sat down. And uh, his idea of being a Christian was something he saw in a movie. And so he was thinking of uh, being a priest and all these other weird things that he saw in a movie that had nothing to do with the gospel. And he completely misunderstood, but he was willing to study with me. Now, Ryan was a very smart guy. He's, he's, he's studying currently to get his uh, Ph.D. in physics. And he was willing to meet. And a lot of the things that we said, he, he had all these kind of ideas about what Christianity was and, and things. And so we would talk about it, and we would go through the Bible. And it was kind of de deconstructing what he was thinking about what Christianity was. And he kind of learning new things, and he would just kind of sit there and think about it, you know, and analyze it because he has that kind of brain. And then he would ask more questions. And then every week we were just slowly going through and just slowly studying the Bible. And God was slowly working in his heart. And finally we, we got to one of the lessons called How to Be Saved. And we went to a restaurant and we were there and we, 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 we had studied the lesson. And at the end of the lesson there's a review question. And the review question says, are you saved? And Ryan looks at me and he just starts crying. He says, yes. And I, I was you are? Well, when, when did this happen? He said, last night. <laughs> he said, you dropped me off. And he says, we were talking about it. And you said, if I need to be saved, just to go up in my room and, and bow down before God and just confess to him and ask him to save me. And he said, I did that. And he says, I know I'm saved. And he says, I know I'm saved. And you've got to understand from the village to a little boy, to a mom that's out there playing by the creek. And there's not many other people out there in the village, maybe just 100 people or so. And then you go into a college student who's studying to get a Ph.D. in physics. It doesn't matter where they're living or what they were doing. The plague of sin was coming for them. And the plague was coming. And what does the Bible say? When he ran in and he, and he took the censer and he made atonement and he held it up, the plague was stayed. It stopped right there. And out there in that village and right there in that restaurant, for those two people, the plague was coming for them. Because they had offended a holy God. But the plague was stayed because someone told them about Jesus. There's another lady that was coming to our church. She was dating one of the guys in the church, and he was a Christian. She wasn't a Christian. And they were coming, and, and she didn't really like to come to church. But she was coming because he was there, and she made it kind of known that she really didn't like coming to church, and, and, and she didn't really think what we were saying was right or true, and, but she would just come on and off, and eventually she started coming more, and uh, eventually, you know, they, they wanted to get married, and I said, well, you know, it's not a great idea, and, and, and they said, well, you know, we've kind of already made this commitment, and it's kind of hard to go back on it because in, our, in the way our culture works and things like that, and I said, well, let's, let's do some marriage counseling, and they said, okay, so we started going to their house every single week and started counseling them. Obviously, my goal in the counseling was give the gospel every single time. I wanted to help them, but each point, every time you help somebody, you say, you need to do this, you need to do this to work on your marriage. It only works if you have the power of the Holy Spirit there to help you to do this. And there's only one way to get the Holy Spirit to help you, and that's through a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And they would hear it, and she would hear it, and she would hear it, and we would be there sometimes till 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night, just going through, and she had questions. And she came from a little village up north. And her parents were Buddhist. She had never heard, before coming to our church, the gospel, besides her boyfriend giving it to her. But she didn't know any Bible stories. She had no back knowledge. And so every little point to grasp, every little thing was a brand new concept for her. And she kept coming and coming, and we were there sharing the gospel. You think you're getting close and nothing. And after a period of time, we were there. Sunday morning service, we were singing, and I don't know what happened. But she came after the service and she said, I don't know what happened either, but we were singing that song, and God moved, and all of a sudden I realized I was a sinner and I needed Him, and I put my faith in Him, and I trust Him now. I don't understand everything still, but I do believe in Jesus. you got to understand, the plague was also coming. She was being deceived by, by, by Buddhism, and she thought she had the medicine that could, that could stop the plague. 
But it wouldn't. The plague would have just gone on through. And like everybody else, she would have died and gone to hell. Unless there was someone there to tell her of Jesus. There's another lady, and you've probably heard this story recently. She was coming to our church, and she was also Buddhist. And she was married at the time, and she came and she brought her daughter to our kids' club. And she started coming to the kids' club, and they really, her daughter really enjoyed the kids' club and, and hanging out with our daughters. And so she wanted to keep coming, but after coming to the first service and hearing me preach, she came to me and she said, she said, Pastor, I, 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 my, my child loves to come to the church, and we want her to learn English, and your kids' club's in English, and all these things. She said, but I'm Buddhist, and I really don't care for what you're saying, and I think it kind of goes against what I believe, and so I don't want to participate in your services. And I was thinking, well, okay, that's fine. As long as your, your daughter keeps coming, then you know, we can at least give her the gospel, and somebody's reaching the gospel. And she said, well, can I just kind of sit outside or sit back in the nursery? And I said, okay. I said, I said, if that's what you want to do, I said, you can do that. And so she was going back, and she started sitting back in the nursery, and sitting back, in, uh, yeah, in the nursery. And we were thinking, if she's going to sit back there, we might as well get a video camera and get a TV and try to route the service right into the nursery. At least, you know, she'll be able to hear it or see it and, and be hearing the gospel. And so we got all that set up, and so next time she comes in, you know, everybody, she's used to going to the nursery, and all of a sudden now we have the TV there, and the, the sermon's coming through. And she was okay with that, because she didn't, wasn't violating her conscience, I guess, and so she kept coming, and she would just sit in there, and she was hearing the gospel. She was hearing the word of God being preached week after week, and God started working in her heart. And then she started coming to our services, and we would have special services, and we would have uh, big meals and banquets and things, and she would start making food for that and coming along. And obviously God was growing her. God was working in her life for her to receive the gospel. And all of a sudden, as, as she was coming, it was on Chinese New Year, we went to her house, and I said, uh, I asked her, I said, you've been coming to our church for a long time now. And it seems that you're excited about the things that we're excited about. When you first came, you weren't that excited about them. But there's a change happening in your life. There's, there's something going on in your life. And she said, yes. Yeah. She said, I don't know what it is. She said, there is something. And I got a couple more questions. And she started listing out these questions. And then about a week later, she called me and she said, Mark, I've trusted Christ as my Savior. But the story gets better. Because as she trusted Christ as her Savior, just before that, she went through a pretty bad divorce. It was bad. And she was just all over the place when she was going through that. And she came to me, and about a week after I got the phone call, she said, something really strange has happened to me. She said, I hated my ex-husband, the things that he did to me. She says, I couldn't stand him. I had all this hate in my heart. She's like, but I believed in Jesus. And she says, you know what happened? All that hate, it went away. She said, I don't know where it went, but it's not there anymore. She said, in my heart, she says, I'm full of a pity for him. She says, I think he needs what I just got. And so let's pray for him that he'll believe in Jesus. And so we started praying for him, and we, we, we said, well, maybe we can go and meet him and share the gospel with him. She's like, well, I don't think he'll meet with you and all these different things. And so we were just praying for him, probably about... Two, three months ago before we, came, before we came back, let's see, two months ago, got another phone call. She said, are you at the church? I said, yes, I'm at the church. And I said, I'm here with one of the Chinese pastors. And she said, she said good. She said, I think my ex-husband's ready to get saved, but I'm not sure. Can I bring him by and you guys make sure? She said, I've been witnessing to him. And God had changed her heart so much that she could forgive her ex-husband and say the thing that he needs, the reason he was doing all those evil things, the reason that he was living like that is because he didn't know Jesus. And if he did know Jesus, his life could be radically changed. Amen. She says, I got to get the gospel to him. She understood that the plague that was going to take her life was on the way to take his life. And all of a sudden, so she brought him to the church and the Chinese pastor sat down with him. And went through the gospel, and he accepted Christ as his Savior. But the story gets better. Because not only did she get saved, and that he got saved, but a couple weeks later, 
Skyla, our second daughter, she came to me after the service. And she said, Dad, she says, I just preached a, a, a sermon on forgiveness. And she came up to me and she said, Dad, she says, I, I think I'm ready to believe in Jesus. And, and she asked, and I, I mean, I literally stopped what I was doing. And it was just like, I couldn't hear anything else but what she was saying. And I was like, all right, let's go to the other room. Let's sit down. Let's talk about this. And that prompted her friend, which was this lady's daughter, to say, I think I'm ready to believe in Jesus. And so they went through it, and I, said, I asked her mom about it, and she said, I, I went home and I talked to her, and she says, yes, she says, I believe in Jesus as well. And she says, I want to follow Jesus. I asked him to forgive me of my sins, and then she got saved. And so right before we came back, that ex-husband and his daughter, we baptized them together there in the church. And if you can think about this in the, and, and take this story and take this illustration and you can put them together and realize that they were standing in the sinful congregation and the plague was on its way and it was moving through and it was going to take their life and all of a sudden somebody ran into the mist right there between the plague, between the dead and the living and held for the censor, held for the gospel. Somebody bared the gospel right there in the middle. And all of a sudden, when it came to that household, the plague was stopped right there. And their lives were saved. But there's more. God's doing amazing work in China. When Cannon came over, we needed a language school teacher for him. And one of the men that's training in the church, his name is LeBron. So we have Charles and LeBron. <laughs> Uh, in our church. And he needed a language school teacher. And LeBron's dad came for Chinese New Year to basically live with them for a month for the holiday. And so he was there, and he's an older gentleman. And, and you know, I said, well, would your dad be interested in teaching Cannon some, some Chinese? And he said, yes. He said, it's hard to find people that are around Chinese New Year because everybody's traveling. And he said, well, he's here for a month. He has nothing to do. I said, all right, let's ask him. And he was, he was glad to be able to sit down and teach Cannon some Chinese. And so we hired him. But you've got to understand, LeBron's dad, he did not like that LeBron became a Christian. LeBron was a Christian before he came to our church, but nobody had ever discipled him. He, he had gotten reached by another American that was there. And he went to an English Bible study and he said, I didn't really understand what he was saying, but somebody translated for me, so I understood. And he said, I understood that I wasn't a good person. I understood that I needed Jesus. And so I confessed my sins and I believed in Jesus. And he said, when I did, I told my dad. And my dad basically said, you have to make a decision. You're going to follow our culture, our traditions. You're going to follow our family or you're going to follow your God. You're going to follow which one? And he had to make a decision of what he was going to do. And he said, Dad, he said, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to follow the Heavenly Father. I'm going to have to follow him because this is true. And so he'd come and he's there and he's teaching, he's teaching Chinese the canon. And as he's teaching, we have a Bible curriculum that they're going through. And so his dad is slowly learning about the gospel by teaching Chinese the canon. He did this for about four weeks, and at the end of the four weeks, he was getting ready to go back. And I told LeBron, I said, I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to try to witness to your dad before he goes back. And he says, yeah, I don't think he's going to get saved. I, you know, he wasn't really that interested. And, and so we sat down, and I shared the gospel with him. And we're going through, and I said, I said do you understand this? He says, yeah, I understand it. I said, I said do, you, do you understand that this is the only way? He says, yeah, this is the only way. There's no other way. I, understand. I said, do you know that you need to repent of your sins and put your faith in Jesus? He says, he says yeah, I've been, I've been here for the past four weeks. And he's like, this is what I need to do. I said, you want to do that right now? And he says, yes, I want to do that right now. Amen. And LeBron just starts crying. I think all of us in the room were just, were just started bawling. And he put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. And then God just started working. He started moving through. And for the next six weeks, it seems like we were seeing people saved every single week, every single service. People were coming forward, and people were being saved. Why? Because somebody ran into the mist and held Jesus high, and people were saved. Now, we don't have time to look at it, but here in the verse, he says that he was standing between the living and the dead. Over 17,000 had already died. 
Aaron, he got there a little late. He got there a little late. 17,000 people had already died. Are we going to get there a little late? Are we going to run into the mist as fast as we can? Hold Jesus high. And as we stand between the living and the dead, understand we can't do anything for the dead. Millions in China have already died without knowing Christ. And that is a hard concept to think about. But I know one thing that's true. There's millions that are still living. And we're going to run into the mist for those that are still living. That they might have a chance. Will you run with me? Heavenly Father. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to come and just tell the amazing stories of how you've been changing people's lives. God, all glory goes to you. You've done incredible things. And Lord, we want to see you continue to do incredible things. Lord, take these gospel bearers and send them around the world. May we run that we might win. May we run that we get there in time. May we run that another soul might be saved. In Jesus' name. With your head Amen. still bowed and your eyes still closed, that sin plague is still moving. And you may not be saved, but you have heard the gospel presented clearly to you today. You have heard how Jesus saved others, and he loves you, and he would save you. It's not about being baptized. It's not about joining a church. It's about realizing you've sinned against the holy God and realizing that you deserve hell, but Jesus died for you. I just want to give you an opportunity right now. Right now, do you know that you've sinned? Do you know that you deserve to go to hell? Are you ready to turn from your sin and turn to Jesus? Just like those Chinese people raised their hand, just like the other stories you heard this morning, it's your day and you can be saved. If you'd simply lift your hand, we'll help you today to be sure your sins are forgiven, to be sure you're on your way to heaven. Would there be anybody in the room and say, I know I'm a sinner, I want to be saved today. Would you just hold your hand up and let me pray for you? Would there be anybody like that? Would there be anybody? You came. The Lord brought you here today. He's dealing with your heart. You can be saved. Father, I pray you would deal with hearts. I pray that you would draw people to you. I pray you'd save people. I pray you'd help Christians. Maybe somebody would surrender to be a missionary right now. Maybe somebody will get saved right now. Maybe somebody would figure out they ought to do more in getting the gospel around the world, hear it locally or f through their prayers and finances. Please do a work. We surrender this all to you. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you'd like to be saved, if you'd like to pray, if you'd like to get some things right with the Lord, whatever it is, you can get out of your seat and come forward and find you a place to pray. There are counselors waiting to help you. If you're a lady, they'll help you. If you're a, if they have ladies here for you, if you're a man, there are men here to help you. We want to help you. So you get through praying, either in your seat or here at the front, you can stand and sing with Stephen as he leads us in this song.
peace to the ends of the earth that with one mighty voice every tribe and tongue rejoices our heart our desire is to see the nations worship you Thank you very much. You can have a seat. It is our heart's desire that all the nations worship, and we definitely want it to be you. If you're here visiting today, we'd like you to be a part of Vision Baptist Church. We'd like to invite you to be here all the time. I'm going to announce our faith promise for next year here in just a minute, but before that, let me ask the uh, every missionary in the conference, if you and your wife could come up here to the front with us and stand here with me. These are the people you've had presenting their ministry. You already support uh, uh, 60 something, come on up. You already support 60 something missionaries around the world. Every one of these are already being supported by uh, our church. And uh, so uh, if you haven't been here all week and you haven't been here, even, some of you came in and uh, you missed part of the service today. Uh, Mark, hold your hand up. This is Mark Tolson. He just spoke. He's a missionary to China. He's been there eight or nine years already. This is Nate Francis and his wife. And they are missionaries to China, raising money now to go. This is Dustin uh, Brown, whatever your name is. Hey, man, I'm an old man. If you know all these names, it's going to be a real test of mine. This is my Alzheimer's test right here. Uh, Dustin Brown's a missionary to, to Turkey. Uh, ought to be China. Uh, just That's a turkey joke, right? Uh, and then this is Jason Rich. Oh, Jan up, Jason. Jason's a missionary to Burkina Faso. You heard him this morning. This is Mike and Deanna Saley. You'll hold your hand up there. And they are missionaries to the United States military overseas somewhere. This is Andrew Wilder. Hold your hand up, Andrew. Uh, Andrew's looking for a wife. <laughs> and Andrew's a missionary to Bolivia. And this is Aaron Vance. He's married. He has a child here with him. His wife is in Ohio, but he's a missionary in Columbia now for quite a few years. And this is Cal Shreve. Uh, he's a missionary to Peru, and they're just back from uh, two years. And this is Tim Kelly. Now, how many of you would like to know what the faith promise was? Is going to? Be? We promised last year two hundred and twenty thousand sixty four dollars. That's what you promised last year. You actually only came through. You promised two hundred and twenty three thousand six hundred and fifty last year. You only came through with two hundred and twenty six hundred forty seven. Three thousand three dollars short. If I had a little more money, I'd have just called us up just so we could have had it. That's a fantastic offering. On top of that, you gave $29,386 last year to foreign missions, bringing it a total of $250,032 uh, that you gave last year. You have currently given $1,884,250 in 12 years, or 12 and a half years to missions. And your promise for next year so far, and it always goes up, but so far is only $243,152, which is a 10% increase. You could give it a round of applause for that. $243,152, so that, uh, that is up uh, uh, roughly 10% from last year, and I'm sure more, more money will be uh, promise, and I just want to challenge you. You make a difference. You help these guys run, but y'all can leave and go to your seats now if you want. They run and they run between the living and the dead. They carry the gospel. What a great message you are today. I hope you've enjoyed the entire week. It has been a lot of fun to hear from our missionaries and see how great our God is and what he is doing. Now, you do not want to miss tonight. I know if you're a regular church member here and you attend everything, you've been to church Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, and Sunday morning uh, twice, because it's Sunday school and church, and now you need to come tonight because Eric and Rebecca Elrod will be leaving for uh, India this week. And so tonight, we'll have, two, we'll have a men's fellowship and they'll be in this room, and Eric will be speaking to us, and we'll pray over him before he leaves, and then we'll have a ladies' fellowship in another room, and Rebecca will be speaking there, and the ladies will pray over her, and then they will be, that'll be the last Sunday they're here in our church for a while as they head back to India with their new uh, adopted daughter, Olivia, and I think you should know about that. So anyway, I hope you'll come and be back tonight. I'm so blessed to serve with you. I'm so proud of you. I love you more than you'd ever 
I dream about you. Uh, last night, Mike Staley was correcting me in my sleep. I had a dream, and he said, you should not be doing that. And I said, you're right, I shouldn't. And so I'm not telling you what I was doing, but <laughs> I, I really shouldn't have been doing it. Uh, but I was asleep, don't blame me. But I can just remember distinctly, Mike goes, now, I don't really think you ought to be doing that. I'm like, will not you shut your mouth? Uh, it wasn't nothing bad. But anyway, I mean, it wasn't, wasn't good, but it wasn't bad. <laughs> Well, man, I'm in trouble digging a ditch here. All right, I hope you've had a good time. We'll have some announcements from Trent real quickly, and we'll be dismissed. It's been wonderful to get to hear the stories from the mission field. And on the Bible, they rehearsed the matter. And they brought it back to the church. You may not be aware of this, but in the hallway right over here, we have prayer letters on the wall. And from the different missionaries, they get changed out. But you could go there. You could go to the prayer letter, and you could get their uh, website, email address, and you could sign up to get it electronically. That's how most of us read it these days, not so much on the wall. But that will give you the contact information. But what you may not know is that every week, our pastor writes a prayer letter uh, to our missionaries um, about our church. Just like this. Your stories have encouraged us this week. Every week when he writes the letter, he tells about what you have been doing um, in your life groups and in Awanas and the ESL class and different things. And it's so exciting as a church that we get to encourage them um, in the same way. So if you're in here and you want to grow and you want to be part of a discipleship, if you heard those stories and you said, that's where I'm at right now, please let me know. I'll connect you with uh, somebody that will take you through uh, discipleship. Today at 415, our Awana workers are going to meet. We typically on Sundays have the 415 teacher and workers meeting. That is a way to make it open for everybody to get involved, the volunteer, how they would like to here in our church. And every Sunday afternoon uh, we do that. Uh, but this afternoon we won't be having it. Uh, but our Awana team is going to be meeting at 415. And as pastors mentioned, um, the, we have a split session tonight, and that will just be wonderful. We'll get to spend that time uh, with them in fellowship and in the Word. The big three for the week, that's the staff missionary, strategic partner, and the country of the week. Every year at the missions conference, I want to challenge you to renew your um, interest um, in the big three, not just to hear it on Sunday mornings, but to take the bulletin and put it on your refrigerator and to really pray through it, to email the missionary of the week, to talk to your kids about the country of the week, and to pray that maybe God would build something in their hearts so that they would be committed and so that as a church and a decade from now, we'll be continuing on this, um, on our mission. Big through this week is Mark and Natasha Tolson and, uh, and his family. They're our staff missionaries or members of our church. Uh, the King family in Argentina and then Afghanistan is the country that we're going to pray for and uh, study about. If you're a guest with us today, we are so honored and thankful uh, that you're here. And what a great Sunday to be on. Even though not every Sunday is like this, it's always a little bit like this, right? Because our heart is for the nations. And we're thankful that we're here. Love to give you any information if you have any questions. Let's stand together and shake hands. Hope you have a great afternoon. Mm -hmm.